A definition are impartial decision makers in the pursuit of justice. They are to examine both sides and fashion punishment that is proportionate to what is morally acceptable to all the parties involved, the victim, the public, and the defendant. I'm going to start out with Mr. Dent. The victim involved in this tragedy is a 58-year-old black man who was driving his Cadillac in Inkster, a suburb of Detroit. On the evening of January 28, 2015, where his life changed forever, he was stopped by the defendant, a then Inkster police officer, and his, and his partner, Officer Zelenowski. Mr. Dent was stopped for a minor traffic offense and ordered out of his vehicle. With his hands extended out of his driver's window, he was grabbed out, thrown to the ground, and struck 16 times in the head by the defendant. In his attempt to arrest him, he was thrown onto a window sh sh shield of a p patrol car, bleeding profusely from a head injury. The responding police officers arrived as the defendant is wrestling the defendant to the ground. Mr. Dent was struck, kicked, and tased while on the ground by what appeared to be a group of angry, anxious police officers that celebrated after the defendant was beaten and cuffed. The video in the car shows the police officers fist bumping as a celebratory act of bravery by the defendant and his cohorts. But the one image that, um, that st struck out to the court was looking at Mr. Dent in his cell, shaking his head. In disbelief of what had occurred to him. If his conduct was indicative of what he was thinking, I would have thought this. What crime did I commit? Being a black man in a Cadillac, stopped for a minor traffic offense by a group of racist police officers looking to do a nigger. As police officer John Zelenowski, auxiliary police officer, testified in court to in his response to a text, was quoted as saying, at least give me the satisfaction of knowing that you're out there beating up niggas right now, LOL. How humiliating and degrading that must have been. He was left in a cell for a number of hours before getting medical treatment. But after hearing the defendant and his fellow officers joke about his injuries as it were wiping blood off their uniforms with disinfectant. 2015, please be quiet in my courtroom. How does this happen? I'm going to tell you how it happened. Some years ago, 19 to be, well, 25 to be exact, I remember coming into this building with such enthusiasm, so excited. And I remember a lawyer telling me that nobody leaves out of this building like they came in. I didn't understand what that meant. 20 years later, I do. Everybody has a grand idea about changing the world and you seem like you felt like you're fighting a losing battle. And little by little, it grows. It's a cancer. It starts to eat away at you. You become cynical. You start to look at pictures of homicides, not for the goriness, but as evidentiary or value to see was the shooter left-handed or right-handed. It eats away at you. You go to social events, you tell people what you do for a living, and after they say, what kind of cases do you hear? And 
and as a judge, prosecution, defense, does criminal defense, a police officer, after a while they say, we don't want to know anymore. That's the job in the criminal justice system. It's compounded with that being a police officer. There's a culture among police officers. And that culture is a norm of understanding all policers, police officers within a department adhere to. Particular norms, values, attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. They come in three forms. The blue wall of silence. Protecting police officers at all costs because supervisors and citizens are distrustful, evil, and untrustworthy. Us versus them. The good police versus the others. Citizens and offenders, they all group together. They're one and the same. Cover up mentality, which discourages officers from trusting supervisors and citizens because the police officers believe that the public didn't understand them. They don't understand true police work. And they are forced to face criticism from others about their job, from the media, from their families and friends. These pressures and expectations force officers who have a pure desire to purely serve the community as an occupation to conform to this group mentally or face being ostracized and labeled as an outcast among that group. These methods of indoctrination are passed along to new police, or police recruits in the academy by stressing the importance of obedience to authority through a structure of shame and honor it teaches them to conform and obey to the prevailing standards of the police culture. Field training, the recruit gets a reality check of what it's like to be out in the city. They then begin to shy away from what they've learned in the academy and automatically they become a a prototype of really who trains them. It's horrible and it's worsened when cities that lack resources to properly train its new and existing officers with, me with methods to combat this culture and adopt new ways to handle the stress of the job. One of the things that prosecutors say is, is that we want to deter others police officers from behavior like this. Being a police officer in a major city with very little funding is damned if you do and damned if you don't. Six months police academy for most cities, long hours, horrible pay. I was out at a mall yesterday. I asked a woman a question. I said, you don't have to answer. How much do you get paid an hour? She said, $15 with benefits. Well, guess what? That's more than what Inkster get. They don't get benefits. The equipment, the police cars are old. We went out to the scene. Early in the morning, there were people who were using drugs. They just kind of came out. And the only thing I could imagine was the only thing that is separating these people from drug selling out of police officers that appeared in my court. Many of the cars, the tires are almost bald. No support services for stress. No mandatory counseling for police officer. We rather put technology, money and technology by buying bait cars and surveillance cameras. But that doesn't reduce crime, it doesn't deter it properly trained police officers do. According to Law Enforcement Today, a publication, police officers have the highest rate of alcoholism, divorce, <laughs> drug abuse, suicide. Their life expectancy is 10 years less than the average American. Police are human beings too. They feel despair and they have ups and downs. 
Their job is made worse because they see on a daily basis, more than any other occupation, the worst behavior that people can inflict on one another. They go to work every day with the knowledge that some of the people that they are sworn to protect and serve want to kill them. The media and their bosses scrutinize their every move, and they get paid worse than security guards at malls, who's the worst crime that can be committed is shoplifting. <clears throat> Many times people say, well, you know, if you can't handle the stress of the job, then you need to take these officers off the street. But how do we as a community expect superior services from police officers who are making security guard salaries to receiving little compensation and struggling just to pay health care? Well, many have said when they accepted a job, they accepted everything that came along with it, and they could handle it or leave. In the great words of a man that I truly respect and honor, slaves had jobs too. Our society is reactionary, not preventative. We would rather save a few dollars to balance a budget than pay millions of dollars to reverse a tragedy that we could have prevented. I know that Mr. Dent would give back every dime of his million dollar settlement to go back to where he was in his life before January 28th. I wonder what would one half of that $1.4 million settlement awarded to Mr. Dent have done for the Inkster Police Department? Training officers that wanted to serve and not hiring officers that didn't belong. It's my belief that when we begin to value and properly compensate and train those that want to serve, then and only then will we as a community receive the type of services that we expect and demand from the defenders of our community, the police. It's amazing how poor cities like Flint can find millions of dollars to attempt to reverse a situation that $100 a day could and would have prevented. The legislators said we didn't know about Flint or we didn't intervene sooner. The government's responsibility is not solely to save money, but is to protect its citizenry by paying and training police officers better. My belief is simple. If we don't invest in our police officers, we're going to see more incidents like the one that I'm presiding over today. We'll pay now or we'll pay greater later. Mr. Melendez, the purpose of this long protracted sentencing was to offer you the one thing that this court believed you didn't give Mr. Dent, fairness and due process. Being a police officer is a tremendous and very rewarding occupation. I believe it's a calling on your life to do justice in the community. On January 28, 2015, you did not fulfill your job. You performed just us, a game that began with the police stop. The purpose of it was to harass and degrade a motorist and inkster. The man chosen for your game was Floyd Dent, a black man. The game went like this. Let's follow a car in a known drug area, and based on your years of training experience, you knew that the motorist would likely be a black person. No license, armed with a gun or drugs in a vehicle. Upon stopping Mr. Dent, you 
knew, and upon stopping Mr. Dent, who was dead wrong for driving with no license or license suspended, running stop signs, and weaving in and out of the back street, which the court saw on the video. You and your sidekick, auxiliary police officer Zelenowski, caught your prey. Upon being stopped, Mr. Dent put his hands out of the driver's window in plain view. Your partner and you pulled him out. When he didn't move fast enough for you, you refer to it as resisting. I call it bowing down to your command. You l utilize your dirty, hairy tactics and use excessive force to arrest him. Your job was twofold. Investigate the situation, be a positive example to Officer Zelenowski. When your posse arrived, they had joined you in the takedown, kicking and tasing and ultimately throwing Mr. Dent into a windshield of a police car with a dash cam, which I refer to as the eye of justice. You were so into your bravado that you forgot the eye of justice was watching you and recording this disgusting beating, seeing Mr. Dent slammed into the window shield with blood running down his face. The dash cam that was designed to protect you ended up being what convicted you. Fist busting after taking him down as a sign of bravery was just another cowardly act caught by the eye of justice. You knew better. You were better trained than any of those officers out there. You were more experienced. Took me several days to read the letters that people sent talking about your character, about the man that you are about how you went in Westland and helped to save three senior citizens from a burning building. Three of those letters, I believe, were from African Americans, and one even professed to be like a mother. One or two things, either they're all racist, or there's something redeeming about you that somehow, in some way, you forgot that night. The way you denigrated that man was awful. Who would know and who would care about a lone black man being assaulted by upstanding police officers? Boy, were you wrong. They say that what you do in the dark will eventually come to light. And yes, it did. It became a worldwide example of what the police is not about, and that's brutality. At the station, the other eye of justice captured you and your posse making fun of Mr. Dent, mimicking him struggling while you all wiped the blood off your uniforms with disinfectant while he watched. Such an awesome, caring, properly trained police officer. You led your fellow officers down a path of cowardly behavior. But today you will pay for it. You will pay for two things, not being an example of greatness, which I know that you are from all the letters of support, awards, and commendation that you have shared with this court, and resorting to cowardly acts of barbaric behavior that led you to be convicted of these crimes. There's an old saying, it ain't no fun when a rabbit's got the gun. It's equally applicable when he has the video the eye of justice in this case. You betrayed your city. You caused your lovely wife heartache. And you caused Mr. Dent severe anguish. And finally, in the words of Vicki Yost, your commander, accountability is required to ensure continued community trust and healing. Today, I can only punish your conduct, conduct 
but only you and God can change your character. I've had an opportunity to listen to both sides. And I had to say this because I didn't say this during the trial, but it was my privilege to be able to oversee this trial because I had great lawyers and great lawyers make jobs real easy. At this time, I am going to commit you to the Michigan Department of Corrections. However, after weighing the allegations in this particular matter and looking at all the circumstances, including what you've done and who the person I really believe that you are, I'm going to commit you to the Michigan Department of Corrections as to count one for no less than 13 months, no more than 10 years. As to count two, I'm going to give you 90 days credit uh, for time served and close it out. The court is going to give you 85 days for credit. You have 42 days to appeal my decision. That includes this matter. Thank you.